So the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus might as well have said, the kingdom of God is a place where nothing is fair. Jesus might as well have said, the kingdom of God is not really a place to go to seek justice. Jesus might as well have said, the kingdom of God is where you better look out for yourself, negotiate cannily on your own behalf to get the best deal. The kingdom of God is a right to work state. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And again at nine, and again at noon, and again at three o'clock, and again at five, and every one of them got the usual daily wage. Not fair. There is so much about this parable that's just unsatisfying. It's hard to put the pieces together in any way that adds up to something that we think Jesus ought to be saying, or that we want to hear Jesus say. For starters, this could be the rallying cry for those of us who would find it much more convenient to live with utter disregard for God and neighbor. And we could just plan a deathbed conversion at the end of the day to make it all okay. This is a long standing thread in Christian and cultural history, all the way from the famously debauched Saint Augustine of Hippo, who is said to have prayed in fourth century North Africa, Lord, grant me chastity, but not yet. All the way down to the American songwriter Gillian Welch, who wrote the lyric, she said, I want to do right, but not right now. Surely the intention behind Jesus's parable is not to affirm the righteousness of this approach. If it were, today's sermon could just be something like, okay, church, let's all get together later. We'll head over to the vineyard right before quitting time. We'll make some easy money. And as long as that works, why shouldn't it work the other way around? Couldn't I put my hour in early and have the rest of the day to myself? This would be like a version of the, of the conversation that I guarantee you will happen in front of televisions all over America this afternoon one that I confess has happened in front of my own television on many fall afternoons, as fabulously wealthy men risk broken bones and brain damage in NFL stadiums, and people all over America say, you know, for that kind of money, why not just play like one season, hire a competent money manager, and retire to some tropical island? So the question there is, what would be the wages for the laborers who started at dawn if they were to walk off the job before lunch? At the end of the day, they worked more hours than the ones who started at five, right? Well, fairness as a concept, like it or not, just doesn't have a super prominent place in the biblical story. But, but isn't fairness at least a little bit sacred? Isn't fairness related to justice and justice to mercy and mercy to God's identity? and intention, and if all that is true, why is Jesus making such a big deal of blowing up our idea of fairness? In other words, why is he telling the story to begin with? Well, the reason he's telling the story is because Peter wants to know what his wages will be. Jesus has just told the disciples how hard it is for the rich to get into heaven, the camel and the needle and all that. And the astounded disciples say, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, for God, all things are possible. And Peter says, well, look, we, we left everything behind. We have made enormous sacrifices. We left everything and followed you. What then will we have? In other words, can't we get some extra credit here? If you're telling me that God is going to shoehorn some selfish fat cats who've given up nothing through the stupid eye of his stupid needle, then what in the world did we make all these sacrifices for? That essentially is Peter's question. What then shall we have? And that is when Jesus tells the story. Everybody gets the usual daily wage. How very contemporary. Everyone gets an award. Everyone gets a participation trophy. 
And we, with Peter, can only cross our arms and harumph. Sometimes it feels like the point of the story is to encourage us to deny that feeling, as if the challenge of the story is to try to work yourself into this impossible place of being the laborer who started in the morning, gets paid the same as the slacker who shows up late, and then don't feel bad about it, because if you feel bad about it, you've blown it. You're supposed to feel good about getting the usual daily wage. And so the question is, in the kingdom of God, what in the world is the usual daily wage? The usual daily wage for working in God's vineyard defies the mathematics of this world. The usual daily wage is impervious to multiplication, division, and all the tools of accounting. For one thing, it doesn't compound. It's a daily wage in the sense that it is renewed every day. It cannot be saved over. It is like the manna in the wilderness. In other words, the wages of life with God is life itself, abundant life. And life with God, we remember, when we manage to get out of Peter's extra credit mindset where we tend to live, is love itself. Think of someone you've loved for five years, and someone you've loved for 10 years, and someone you've loved for 50 years. Do you love the one twice as much or five times as much as another? The usual daily wage does ultimately submit to a kind of mathematical description, but it's not one that's useful to accountants and economists. It's infinity. The usual daily wage for working in God's vineyard is not something received in transaction by unit of time or unit of service, but something experienced in transformation. It is communion with God through service to humankind. It is redemption discovered through forgiveness. It is infinite love, not transacted, received, and pocketed but breathed and inhabited hour by hour by hour and day by day by day. Amen.